So in many ways, it's no surprise that nature has been able to find these interesting, efficient solutions to problems. After all, brains and the bodies that they in some sense control have co-evolved. It's not the case that the brain has to evolve a control strategy for a body that is just parachuted in from nowhere. Um, instead, the reliable properties of the body are always present during the evolutionary time period in which the brain is evolving. It's interesting in the same sort of way to start to think about the reliable properties of the environment, because after all, those are present while the brain and the body are evolving in just the same way. So a favorite example of mine, an example that shows the kind of delicate matching between brain, body and environment, is the swimming capacities of the bluefin tuna. The bluefin tuna is a prodigious swimming machine that can go very fast, can turn rapidly, can um, blast off very successfully from a standing start. But it turns out that when you examine the actual pure physical capacities of the fish, I must say I'm not entirely sure how these get to be measured, but somehow when you measure the actual capacities of the fish to do things like um, turn and blast off through the water, it turns out that the fish itself is too weak by a factor of about seven to turn as fast as it does, to blast off as quickly as it does, and so on. So in a series of interesting studies, starting at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and continuing at Olin College, scientists have been looking at the swimming capacities of the tuna. It turns out that what the tuna does is to make the most of its watery environment. A tuna will make the most of currents that are available, stepping into currents to go faster. But more interestingly than this, it will actively flap its tail to create small vortices in the water, which it then steps into in order to blast off more, efficient, more efficiently, to turn more quickly, and so on. So these kinds of uh, story about how the tuna works have been tested at MIT and now at Olin using uh, a robot tuna uh, coated with, with lycra and performing in large watery environments. And some of this work has now led to a new generation of submarines that exploit properties like this. Notice that the tuna is making very short-term changes to its immediate environment to improve its swimming, to get energy back from its environment to work better. But in fact, many creatures make long-term, far-reaching changes to their environments. And this can structure the world to make their interaction with the world more successful. So let's look at an example of this, another example with ants, um, this time of collective behavior. So these ants are just moving to a new nest, normally a crack in the rock, but in this case made by two slides so we can see what they're doing. They start by bringing in the eggs from their previous nest and each of the eggs exudes an odor. So the more they place eggs at the rear of the nest, the more the odor is spread and the gradient is clearer and it becomes easier for more ants to bring more eggs. And so they very quickly build up this collection of eggs. But they also have to build a little wall across the entrance to the nest um, to guard themselves. And this is made of lots of particles that the ants are picking up. So how do they build this wall? Well, again, they just use simple cues. Each ant running around will pick up a particle if it runs into it. If it's then running with a particle, crosses the nest entrance, going towards the gradient of this odor from the eggs, it will drop the particle where it is. Other ants running around with particles will run into a particle on the ground and they'll just drop the particle when they run into another particle. So between these two behaviors, these two simple rules, they'll actually start to build a wall because the first rule will seed the wall in a particular place just near the nest entrance. And the second rule will mean that as a wall is built, the wall will get bigger because there's just a feedback of the particles already there causing more particles to be deposited. So the ants will continue until they have a wall and can add no more. And in fact, we can show that this really works by programming some simple robots to do just these two behaviors. So in this case, the robots use a gradient of light instead of an odor, um, and they can detect a line on the ground instead of the nest entrance. But otherwise, they're doing just what the ants were doing. They're picking up the particles when they run into them. They drop the particle if they cross the line going towards the light and they drop the particle if they run into another particle already on the ground. And as you can see through this sort of time lapse of the robots running around, they very quickly 
build a successful wall, just like the ants did. So we can see this kind of behavior even in larger interesting structures, such as the mounds built by termites or complex bird's nests. And in general, it's a principle that this interaction with the world structures the world itself and makes any kind of complex task easier. So, so far, a lot of the complexity that we've been observing has been in the system's interactions with the world. But the reasonable question at this point will be, how does all this scale up to higher cognition? How does it scale up to thinking, reasoning, planning, having concepts that give you a grip upon your world? In one way, we can see that the structured human-built environment provides many of the same opportunities as the simpler environments that we've been looking at, the environment for the ants, for example. Think of Wikipedia entries. In the case of Wikipedia, we create structure in the world, different people add to the structure, and the way that they add to the structure changes the way that other people add to the structure. At the same time, though, there's a real question about how all that kind of knowledge gets into us in the first place. Fortunately, there's also substantial evidence that embodied interaction simplifies learning. A nice example is the baby bot work coming out of Genoa um, from the lab of Giorgio Meta and colleagues. So in the case of baby bot, baby bot uses its own actions to help it learn about the world. It can see its own arm in its field of vision and it's good at detecting motion. It sweeps its arm across the field of vision and if it encounters an object, then the typical, the sort of unique signature of motion, of increased motion that, uh, that, that is produced at that moment is a cheap way of knowing that BabyBot has encountered an object, that these are the boundaries of the object and so on. So you can imagine the sort of the change in the, in the motion flow when you encounter an object and on it goes. Another example in the same sort of area is just the general use of robotic interactions with the world to create rich time-locked patterns of multimodal self-stimulation. So if I poke and pull and shove at the world, then I can make objects move around. Sometimes I can make them make noises. Sometimes I can, uh, I can bring them close to my face so that I can smell them. These time-locked patterns of multimodal response from the objects in the world are a good clue, again, that we are precisely encountering objects, the kind of thing that it's probably worth bringing into our conceptual repertoire. So the general hope hereabouts is that patterns of embodied interaction with the world provide a kind of way in, a sort of, uh, a sort of developmental trajectory in which concepts, the building blocks of higher cognition, can begin to come into focus. To illustrate these ideas about concepts, we can think about what it might take to allow a robot to recognize a chair. Chairs come in so many different sizes, colors, constructions, that there's no simple list of properties that we could make that allow us to have a visual system simply know that something is a chair or not a chair. But nevertheless, we can look at an object and almost instantly assess, is this a chair or is it not a chair? James Gibson in the 1950s argued that what we're really understanding by a chair is the concept of sitability. It's about understanding the object as something that we can interact with in a particular way. This object is something that will support our weight and allow us to bend in the right places to be able to sit on it. And that we acquire this concept through thousands of interactions with the world, with real chairs and other objects that we find we're capable of sitting on. So if we, if we follow this line of argument, it means that to make a robot recognize a chair in the same way that we do, it would have to have the same capability to sit on things, the same ability to find out through its own experience what will or will not support its weight, what will or will not allow it to bend in the appropriate places to sit. Now, importantly, I'm not arguing that when we recognize something as a chair, we have to actually go through this process of sitting on it, but rather that through our experience, we build up an internal model of the actions, the interactions that occur when we actually sit on something. And that we can then, in our imagination, when looking at some new object, decide if this is something that we think we should be able to sit on or not. And this is the, the essence of what these concepts are. If we now look perhaps more generally at robots and robots getting around in the world, take, for example, the urban challenge robots, which were robots 
um, embedded in cars who had to drive around a real urban environment, interacting with other cars, dealing with intersections, with road signs and so forth. Um, their success was really supported by a key factor, and that is having multi-layer control systems where the lowest levels of the control system involve this direct interaction with the world, keeping the wheels on the road, detecting if a collision is about to occur, tracking moving objects, and making appropriate evasive actions. All those things were happening at this lowest level, and that frees up the higher levels, the conceptual levels, for the robot to then think about more abstract, important plans, such as how to get from A to B. So in planning a route from one part of the city to another, we don't want to have to take into account the possible location of every single moving object around us and whether that might intersect with our path. We don't even want to have to think about the exact curvature of the roads that we're following, but rather we want to have an abstract map of where we want to go and we rely on the fact that at the lowest levels, when we want to drive down a road, we have sensory systems that allow us to do the immediate interaction that keeps us on the road and allows us to see a moving object and avoid it. So it's this idea of abstracting away the internal model from the real world interaction that's really key. But of course, it can't be too abstract. It has to be grounded in the world, in our experience with the world, in learning from the world, so that we stay in sync with the world, so to speak. So one more time, the philosopher feels that they have to come in and raise the spectre of higher cognition. So we've been hearing a lot about uh, maintaining an ongoing interaction with the world, structuring that ongoing interaction across many layers. But when we think about at least the caricature representations of cognition that we encounter in the media or, uh, or just in, in art, what we typically see is a representation of somebody just thinking. So think about Rodin's thinker, kind of sitting there like that or something. Um, cartoon characters where suddenly the little light bulb goes off over their head. Or just the general image of you sitting in the bath having a sudden moment of revelation. Nonetheless, I think if we actually pause to reflect on what most of real world higher cognition looks like, it actually doesn't look like that at all. That's not to say that those things don't happen, but in general, when we're engaged in higher cognitive processing, thinking, reasoning, planning our, our family vacation, thinking about the unfolding of the, the economy over the next 10 or 20 years. What we do is we sit in crowded offices surrounded by, uh, surrounded by desktop machines, smartphones of one kind or another, pen, paper, graphs, all kinds of equipment. And it's the human brain and the human organism immersed in that sea of equipment which seems to be, in most daily cases, the real thinking machine. A nice simple example is just the use of pen and paper to do long multiplication. In a case like that, using routines that we've acquired at school, we basically um, reduce a complicated piece of problem solving to a sequence of smaller pieces of problem solving that brains like ours can easily comprehend. So you take the long multiplication, you turn it into lots of short multiplications with um, results stored in a, an external buffer on the page. This seems to me to be quite a good model of how an awful lot of human cognition actually operates in the wild. In this kind of way, you might think that the structures that we place around ourselves are for us something like the watery environment for the tuna. This, this is the environment with which we interact and those interactions simplify the problems that brains like ours need to solve, even in the domain of higher cognition. So I think the moral of all of this, really, is that we do need to avoid, even in the case of higher cognition, what you could think of as the naked brain fallacy, the fallacy of assuming that all the interesting cognitive action is always going on in the brain, rather than being spread in delicate and often um, hard to understand ways between what the brain's doing, what the body's doing, and what the manipulable external world makes available. So where does that leave us? Our conclusion is that we should not think of minds as disembodied computers in charge of meat machines, but rather as completely integrated and intermingled with our physical capacities and our interactions with the world. And that means to create artificial minds, we'll have to build systems that are embodied and that develop and learn inside robot bodies. So that's my job. 
And for philosophers like Andy, the essential message is to keep the body in mind.